Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute for Government, or welcome back in several cases I see from faces. Um, some people, it's their fourth meeting in under a week. Um, 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 I have a kind of honorary season ticket. Um, um, and particularly glad to, um, to have this event, which has been in gestation for about six months, when uh, uh, Nick Harvey first contacted me and said he wanted to uh, produce his reflections on his period as a minister in the coalition, as a Lib Dem uh, minister, and his, what his experiences have been, and also to look forward to um, what might or might not happen after the next election um, in terms of how a coalition should operate. Now, we at the Institute have been doing a lot of work um, on the coalition. Uh, Cash Pound, my colleague who's sitting right, right in front of me, um, has um, ever since um, four and a, about four and a half years ago, um, the first report of three so far that Akash uh, uh, di has done on the work of the coalition because of novelty in the UK, though not such a novelty in other countries, an important aspect of actually looking at coalitions um, and how they function. It's been treated as that this is something which has never happened elsewhere, rather forgetting it's happened in Scotland, and happened for eight years in Scotland, and happens in, frequently in other countries. So look at a lot of the issues um, which Nick Harvey raises, of course, have been raised in other countries and been resolved in various different ways. So this carries on a lot of work we've been doing at the Institute on the operation of the coalition, looking, we looked at it, what happened at, at the midterm, and then we've looked at the operation over the, some of the strains in the final year. And uh, we'll also be producing a report um, next month um, looking at some of the questions um, of um, um, an age of minorities um, is the way um, the study has been looked at to look at how um, a new government might be formed if we don't have an overall majority and in particular to look at some of the options not just another coalition um, which people might say is one of the less likely options but certainly to look at how a minority government um, the impact of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act Looking at not only the, how the, uh, uh, such a government, a minority government, or a coalition government, if we have one, would work, but also the process of negotiation and a lot of the lessons. So, in a sense, um, uh, Nick Harvey's Inside Out, which you've all got copies of and it's on the website, is central to that debate. Uh, Inside Out means that we act as a publisher for someone's views. We don't just endorse them. Um, um, and we've had um, Conservative um, participating in the coalition writing Inside Out. Um, we've had inside outs from former civil servants, and um, we, we've had them from a variety of sources. It's a personal view, um, and it's meant to provoke debate. And certainly, when I first re read the draft of Arthur Rose Garden, I felt it would provoke debate um, in, in every way. Now, you'll notice there's a missing chair. David Willits will be joining us later on. David, of course, had experience in the coalition um, as universities minister until last summer, um, when he worked actually for Lib Dem Secretary of State. So it's a very different experience which Nick Harvey had working for two Conservative Secretaries of State of Defence, um, Liam Fox and Philip Hammond. And those of you who read after the Rose Garden will see that the experience was slightly different. They weren't the identical ministers um, in, in any shape or form. They operated very differently. And what I think is particularly valuable about what we'll hear um, from Nick in a minute is that experience he had as a minister. So what he's saying isn't just kind of theoretical exercise in what would be um, a good way of organizing coalition negotiations in the future, but directly is based on experience in working in a department with two conservative secretaries of state um, and then reflecting on what might happen or what should happen um, if there's a hung parliament and if the opportunity for a, a future coalition arises. So we're going to hear Nick talk for a few minutes. I hope David will, will arrive in that interim period um, and uh, to give his reflections both in response to uh, Nick's Inside Out, um, which uh, he, he's seen, and then we'll um, have a a little debate between the two of them and then open it up to questions. And looking at the audience um, today, um, I'm sure there'll be no shortage of questions. So, Nick Harvey. Well, Peter, thank you very much for those words of introduction and thank you to all of you for coming along today for what I hope will be a lively discussion about coalition negotiations and the machinery of government that is needed in order to make coalition a success. 
Back in 2007, when Ming Campbell was the leader of the Liberal Democrats, and there was a lot of speculation that there might be an election that autumn, I presented a piece of research to my Liberal Democrat colleagues at our summer um, away day gathering at Henley Management School, showing them just how likely it was that an election was going to produce a hung parliament but how many different permutations of outcome there were within that definition of a hung parliament and how different the political dynamics might be in response to whichever of those uh, arithmetical outcomes should emerge. It might have been, for example, a hung parliament in which you could only add our seats to the Conservatives to make um, 326, or you could only add our number to Labour to make 326, or you could add our number to either, or if we had quite a small number of MPs and others had quite a large number, and this might be becoming more pertinent again now, a situation where you could add our number to neither of the others and get them to the halfway mark. And I was encouraging my colleagues to think very clearly how they would react in those different scenarios and what the demands and expectations would be if we went into discussions with other parties against any of those different backcloths. Thereafter, um, my role in preparing the party for such things uh, moved onto a backbench and I uh, busied myself with defence matters and Nick Clegg took over the party leadership. There was no election in 2007, and separate arrangements were made planning for the hung parliament contingency. It's worth saying that pretty well every opinion poll in the second half of the last parliament suggested that there would be a hung parliament as the outcome, and yet despite that, it still seemed to take us all by surprise. I'll readily acknowledge it even took me quite by surprise, having spent an entire political career dreaming of the great day, we would form a partnership with Labour and the uh, reforming left of the nation would be put back together again after the 20th century split. I had little imagined waking up to find that we were in a position where we could only make an arrangement with the Conservatives, but nevertheless that was the outcome. And when I thought about it, I realised that a more acute reading of the polls had actually indicated for a very long time that that was going to have been the outcome. The Conservatives, I would observe, were clearly rather less taken by surprise than we were. And it's been perfectly obvious to me from that moment. Indeed, from the moment at noon on the Friday after the election night, when David Cameron made his big offer to the Liberal Democrats of a fully blown coalition, that the Conservatives had wargamed that scenario very much more comprehensively than we had, and we in turn had wargamed the whole hung Parliament thing very much more comprehensively than Labour had. Indeed, <coughs> they didn't seem to have given the matter any serious attention whatever, and if we were half caught with our pants down, I can only observe that they were completely caught with theirs down and some of the uh, tales that came back from the discussions that we attempted to hold with the Labour Party um, were comical um, but also pretty desperate. So I hope they're better prepared for any such discussion that arithmetic might render necessary <coughs> in the outcome that we expect in just a few weeks' time. So after 80 years out in the wilderness, after most of us spending most of our political lifetime preparing for this great day, it finally came in the midst of the worst economic crisis in over 100 years, with the markets breathing down the government's neck, wanting to see evidence that a new government was capable of tackling the huge crisis that faced the nation. Uh, I, I would say that the Labour government in its last 18 months kept a very steady nerve during the economic crisis, but quite understandably delayed most of the big and painful decisions until after an election. Frankly, anybody else would have done exactly the same, so I offer no party political criticism of that, but it contributed to 
a climate in which the world expected a government to be formed and to be formed damn fast. And my goodness, it was. It was formed in a matter of five days or so. And during those days, when we had all gathered here in London, the Liberal Democrats were having regular meetings in a transport house in Smith Square, rather ironical, the former uh, Labour Party HQ serving as our base during those discussions. But there we were, Lib Dem MPs, peers, members of our national executive, hearing the ebb and flow of the discussions that our negotiators were undertaking. And looking back, and one of the points I make very uh, clearly in my pamphlet, the whole discussion focused almost exclusively on the realms of policy and what the new government was going to try and do. And actually, a surprisingly comprehensive policy prospectus was put together, and this was largely presented to the nation, the coalition agreement, as the basis of the coalition. And certainly a, a great number of Liberal Democrats took a, a great deal of pleasure from the outcome of that negotiation. And the bean counters computed, welcome David, that 73% uh, of the Liberal Democrat manifesto had found its way into the coalition agreement, as opposed to, I think, only 67 or 8% of the Conservative manifesto. And there's a great deal of sort of cheering and self-congratulation. But I looked at the totality of that coalition agreement and thought to myself, hmm, well, this was our moment of greatest strength and leverage in any negotiation. This is the point at which to try and impose our will on as much of the government's business as we can. We've done pretty well out of that, but it's only going to last about 18 months. I wonder how things are going to pan out over a five-year term. And it struck me at the time, and this isn't simply um, looking back after the event, that the way things worked out in practice would reflect far more the decisions that were made about personnel. How many Liberal Democrats there would be in the government, what posts they would occupy, how well supported we would be with resources and political advice, and how able we would be to sustain the business of government in partnership with a party that had very different views on a great deal of uh, the political agenda from ourselves. But the whole thing got underway. There was a great deal of uh, enthusiasm. R relations were cordial and businesslike. I found myself in the Ministry of Defence, as Peter said, as deputy to Liam Fox. There were two issues in defence that we clearly disagreed about. One was Trident, the other was European defence cooperation, where Liam seemed to view a close working relationship with the French as an alternative to European defence cooperation, and we looked at it rather as a first instalment on the way. But um, there were no absolutely pressing disagreements, and we had the huge challenge of a strategic defence and security review to conduct in very quick time ahead of a comprehensive spending review that autumn. And I think in other departments around Whitehall, the sheer immensity of tackling the deficit, trying to get the public finances under control, making painful decisions that none of us came into politics wanting to make, meant that there was a, a brisk drumbeat of government business. But it was as time went on that we began to realise that the arrangements that we had made, the number of posts that we had secured, the lack of political assistance, the lack of resource, had all been negotiated just too quickly. And in the autumn of 2010, we held a seminar in Church House to which we invited, this is the party we, to which we invited liberal and democrat ministers, past and present, in various different European coalitions uh, around different countries in Europe. Some coalitions with parties on the centre-right, others on the centre-left, some more comprehensive arrangements than others. But the one abiding message that all our guest participants drummed into us throughout the day was, if you don't agree to something, don't agree to it. And we all thought, bugger, wish someone had... <laughs> wish 
wish someone had mentioned that at the time, uh, because, of course, we had already by this stage sold the pass on most notably the student tuition fees and a few other issues as well, police commissioners, various other things that we were really supporting through gritted teeth. And in fairness, Conservatives were going through the lobbies on other issues with equally gritted teeth. And really, the advice came from all of those Europeans, this is what will happen if you attempt to negotiate a comprehensive five-year coalition agreement in five days. And this is why we don't do that. This is why we take weeks or even months, hammering everything out to the nth degree and only then embarking upon uh, a programme for government. I don't, unfortunately, think that is possible in the British system where we obsess ourselves about who the government is and the idea of leaving the civil service free reign to run the country for two or three months might not appeal to politicians, not least as they might do a rather good job um, and people would compare it favourably with the, the, the norms. Whether we could perfect some interim government construct for a few weeks while you hammered out the detail, I don't know. But the conclusion I drew was that some of the things I thought had been most inadequate about the 2010 deal, process, personnel, protocols, how the machinery of government should work in a coalition, would best be addressed straight away. Let's get as much of this aired and articulated and debated, possibly even, in a sense, negotiated, before the election, before the hung parliament, before the pressure of the clock ticking, when understandably the focus would be on policy. And so drawing on the things that I had experienced, which I felt had worked well, and the other things which I'd experienced that I thought uh, had not worked so well, I proceeded to write th this pamphlet. And the most striking thing for me was that the relationship that the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister had, where the Deputy Prime Minister got to see at the same time the Prime Minister did every government paper passing his desk and had to agree to every uh, government uh, executive action flowing from that, was a world apart from the experience of ministers sent into Conservative-led government departments where I remember saying at a, a lunchtime event here that I had felt parachuted in behind enemy lines with no line of communication open to um, base camp, using my ingenuity and wit to forage off the local countryside, hoping to find some friendly natives, and guessing what uh, command and control would have wished me to do in these circumstances, but with precious little opportunity um, to test my thesis. And... I think that was the experience for most of my colleagues in those early days. I was in a lucky position. I was quite clearly the Deputy Secretary of State in the Ministry of Defence. There was only one Minister of State, and that was me. For others who had got very junior parliamentary undersecretary posts in different government departments, the task with which they had been charged of trying to protect coalition equities and impose a Lib Dem will on the work of their entire government department was frankly impossible for them to execute. The civil service uh, could have helped if there had been an agreed protocol, if it had all been hammered out in advance how this was meant to work. Indeed, if there had been the sort of arrangement that had been put in place between the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister in every department between the Secretary of State and the Liberal Democrat Minister, it would have been a completely different dynamic in each department and it would have been genuinely a coalition government. What I found was that the Conservative Secretaries of State varied. Michael Gove, I was told by my colleague Sarah Tether, who was our Minister in Education at the beginning of the Parliament, Michael Gove was genuinely very interested in what the Liberal Democrat policy was 
on every aspect of education. He became probably more familiar with it than we were in the end. Uh, he, he was only too delighted that we should have a, a policy advisor, uh, but the policy advisor seemed to spend most of their time with Michael Gove, explaining what Liberal Democrat policy was on various different aspects of education. At the other extreme, there were secretaries of state who were downright hostile to the coalition and would have no truck with any of this. And in between were others who were just basically executing business as normal and would respect the locus of the Liberal Democrat in the specific portfolio that they had been given, but were not remotely willing to allow them to play a, a broader roving role across the work of the department. And because the civil service hadn't been given an instruction or a protocol as to how this was meant to happen, they didn't really help a great deal either. And in the Ministry of Defence, I set about trying to keep across the work of the department by building myself a network of spies to keep me informed on what was going on and when I thought it necessary from time to time, erecting little roadblocks to try and stop things going through that I didn't want to see proceeding. But you can see the point of my analogy with being behind enemy lines and living by one's wits. There was no agreed methodology by which these sorts of things were to happen. The other thing that struck me was that it was completely ridiculous if we were performing this comprehensive deal for a five-year period that you could have government departments with no Liberal Democrat minister in them. Why on earth should we support legislation or indeed executive action coming out of any government department where we haven't had an input to it? And I think this is the, the chief recommendation that I would make, is that if we go into another coalition where our participation is the difference between a government being able to be formed or not being able to be formed, it is absolutely essential as a minimum demand that we must have a Liberal Democrat minister in every government department. It's completely unacceptable for there not to be one in any government department. And equally, given that most departments have at least three or four special advisors, one of those should in every case uh, be there to support the Liberal Democrat minister. So that, I think, is, is, is my biggest demand, that if we ever get ourselves into this decision-making uh, again, we demand a minister in every department. Where they're not the Secretary of State, they should explicitly be the Deputy Secretary of State and have the same arrangement with consecutive access to papers that the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister have, that the Liberal Democrat minister should be able to initiate policy work summon papers, instruct work to be done, that we should be braver about using Liberal Democrats beyond Parliament to come in where they have expertise to offer. The Conservatives are very good at bringing in Tory outsiders to write very good studies and reports. They're much better, uh, the Conservatives, at filling government appointments with their own. We've been a, a bit uh, slow off the mark on some of that, I would say. And I also think that the discipline of having two parties in a government has brought back some of the better behavior in government that had perhaps rather ebbed away during the course of three consecutive, very comfortable Labour terms. In the, in the autumn of 2010, the Sunday Times started a series of articles probing why it was exactly that defence ministers in 2006 had thought it made sense to go into Helmand province in Afghanistan with only 3,500 troops. We ultimately ended up with 10,000 there, augmented by many times that number of Americans. And they asked, was it really that the Labour ministers were stupid or reckless? Or had they not really been given adequate advice? Did the military spell out to them that the body armour wasn't adequate, that the armoured vehicles weren't adequate, that the number of helicopters were not going to be adequate? Did ministers recklessly decide to ignore this advice and plough on with this adventure? So I started asking questions about, you know, 
Where was the advice? What had it constituted? I was told, and I accept this, that advice given to the previous government was not uh, available to the new government to look at. But people were creeping out of the shadows and telling me that my predecessor, my Labour predecessor, had started a similar line of inquiry and had found that there was basically nothing there. It had all been a function of sofa government. And I think that one of the uh, improvements that having the coalition brought about was that the need to hammer things out and explicitly agree them brought better discipline, better record keeping, and uh, better government behaviours. And I think that we could learn a lot from that. Holding regular meetings of ministers in department, bringing parliamentarians into the loop early if you're going to have tricky legislation rather than leaving it late and getting yourself into a complete crisis. All of these are disciplines from which we could learn. So I have set out in this pamphlet a series of things I believe the Lib Dems should insist if we are the difference between the next government being able to be formed as a majority or not. And I hope that by getting them out there now and kicking off a debate, which I hope will start here, um, that we can articulate some of those issues before the event and before those heady days afterwards where any discussion will focus very much on policy. I don't expect um, the other parties to be skipping with delight when they read these demands, but I think it's as well to, to get it out there now and to start a discussion about it. In summary, my uh, conclusion from two and a half years in the government and about the same supporting it from the back benches is that when you have a coalition between a larger party and a smaller party, it's quite difficult for the smaller party to make the larger party do something it doesn't want to do. But the reverse should not be uh, so, so much of a problem. It should be relatively easy for the smaller party to stop the larger party doing something it doesn't want them to do. Because the larger party cannot do a thing. It cannot do a damn thing without the consent of the smaller party. And it well behoves it to remember that. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Um, I'm delighted um, to welcome uh, David Willits. David is a former governor of the Institute um, before he became a universities and science minister. He had a different experience, a matching experience to Nick Harvey in a way, because he um, led a, a, was a senior conservative minister in a department, one of the few departments, headed by a, a Liberal Democrat. So he had a very different perspective on this. David. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Peter. And I enjoyed uh, Nick's remarks. Let me just briefly pick up on some of the things he said. First of all, um, I completely agree with Nick's final comment about the, the business of government being dispatched in a kind of disciplined way through cabinet and cabinet committee. I mean, David Cameron in opposition, in the shadow cabinet, had assured us that this is what he wanted to do, but I know that that's what leaders of the opposition always <laughs> say. Uh, I hope it would have happened anyway, and I think in some ways his kind of view of how government functions is that you do things properly and all that, but certainly having the disciplines of coalition ensured that real business went through cabinet and a cabinet committee, and I particularly think of the occasions when in cabinet issues of peace and war came up, and the absolute, the, the ghost of previous decisions on our shoulders as the Attorney General was circulating his legal advice to every member and the Chief of the Defence Staff was there to answer a, a, any questions. So yeah, I think I agree with Nick on process. Although the Institute of Government perhaps is rather more interested in the process than all of the outcomes. I have to say, I think that the substance of what the coalition has done, by and large, has been a success. I hope that historians will judge the coalition quite favorably. And you have to remember what things were like in May 2010. We had a multiple crisis. We had a fiscal crisis with the biggest deficit of any G7 country. 
And although we know now that the markets have an apparently insatiable appetite for our government debt, it wasn't totally clear <laughs> in May 2010 <laughs> that that was the case. So there was real angst. So we did, we, it was important to signal that we were serious about getting grip of the, of the deficit, when at the same time there was no overall majority for any party to form a government. Not completely unprecedented, but very unusual in post-war Britain. And then third, the expenses scandal having reduced overall confidence in politics and the political process. And I personally think that the way in which the political system as a whole handled the circumstances of May 2010 reflects well on all the participants. And then, and I think here the, the civil service advice was correct, I remember the very clear guidance that came out from Gus that we certainly um, followed in biz that neither party's manifesto was a relevant document for the civil service as they did policy work. The only relevant document was the coalition agreement. And the, biz, uh, the way in which we functioned in biz was that the machine did not respond to anything because it had been in the Conservative or Lib Dem manifesto. They only responded to uh, requests that emerged from the coalition agreement. So I think that, so I think overall I would judge that a success. On the kind of how it then functioned, both from a Conservative view and from a Lib Dem view, Certainly, I think from the Conservative view, we were often impressed with the discipline of the Lib Dems, partly because of the kind of democratic process that they had gone through in May 2010. Mm. And I mean, in some ways, it was easier for them, because 50 or 60, you can just about get everybody in a room and discuss things. I remember one colleague saying to me, we were discussing early on how these meetings, he said, I don't quite know what they do, they're Lib Dems. Maybe they all just gather in a room and sing Kumbaya. Right. But, they, <laughs> but they seem to get into a kind of weekly session where having voted overall to go into this agreement, there was a kind of sharing of views. For the Conservative Party, we've got 300 MPs. And the meetings of the 1922 committee are not quite a um, decision-taking body <laughs> that um, would one would want to be steering government on a <laughs> weekly basis. Uh, but I think looking back, we, we should, if this ever happens again, we need a more explicit democratic process whereby conservative members of party buy into it. But of course, what we thought at the time, and I know there are some backbenchers who are wary of this, but in the shadow cabinet at the time, we thought there was a real risk of a Lib Lab pact we thought various things were being offered by uh, Gordon Brown and Mandelson that maybe, with the wisdom of hindsight, were not necessarily being offered. But there was certainly a sense we'd got to move fast and we've got to get on with it to clinch a deal before uh, we lost it to Labour. So, but looking back, I think our parliamentary party didn't have quite the same sense of buy-in to the coalition as the Lib Dems one, and which in turn was reflected in impressive discipline by uh, Lib Dems through the tough years of government. Uh, on Nick's question of kind of, well, how, how would he, in his vivid image of him kind of operating in hostile territory behind enemy lines, how was that supposed to work? Well, I think that it, I, don't th I think he's a bit harsh on his own side there. I think the Lib Dems, it took them a year or so to work out, but essentially there was a massive staffing up of the DPM's office. And the DPM's office became a very substantial operation indeed, which enabled him to be briefed on what was happening across government. And our view was pretty clear. If there was a Lib Dem minister who had an issue, he could go to and raise it with the DPM's office as something that he or she was concerned about. And there was both the normal process of doing government business through cabinet committee, but there was also this crucial Monday morning session when the PM and the DPM got together on their unresolved issues. And it was when there was uh, a group, you'd, they would basically do a deal on what should or shouldn't happen in a whole host of areas where there appeared to be a difference between the two parties. Now, for us, sitting as ministers in department, it was not unlike, it reminded me a bit of how EU negotiations are conducted. Because you'd know you wanted X, and there was some disagreement on X. And what you'd been told, and I'd be told by my side at number 10, right, okay, that'll be one of the issues on the table on Monday. You did not know what the other half dozen issues were necessarily that Monday. You may have a good idea of some of them. And you certainly weren't privy. You didn't know if you were being traded. When some, either you get your way and you don't get your way, you were never totally clear what you were being traded off against in the decisions that day. But that was, I think, mm. a, 
sensible way of proceeding. And although Nick gets all excited about the government doesn't have a majority unless the Lib, unless the Lib Dems uh, agreed, remember it's incredibly important for the third party to show that it can make coalition work. And for the Lib Dems, having an effective coalition was massively in their advantage. So I think there were incentives for both sides to make those Monday negotiations and the wider, um, and the wider negotiations work. Um, let me end with a, a reflection on one specific and one general. Um, Nick referred to university fees, uh, which was, as one could see, uh, has, has been a particularly tricky issue for the Lib Dems. I mean, it's, it's just worth recording, of course, that the, the coalition agreement provided for the Lib Dems not to be involved in that particular issue. We were very aware, and I think there were three or four, and wasn't nuclear another one? I mean, there was, yeah. there was a very small list of issues which were so tricky for one party or the other that we agreed to disagree, and university fees was one of the small number of issues that was carved out um, on that uh, basis. The issue for the Lib Dems was then how they would have hand that, handled that, but they did have a clear carve out. Finally, on the dynamics of all this and how the coalition worked, um, I think it's been in the interest of both parties to show that we can uh, govern competently when um, there was no overall majority. Uh, and I realise the kind of anxieties and frustrations on the Lib Dem side that Nick describes. I think, on the other hand, you can see a political problem for the Conservatives in all this as well. And to my mind, the political problem for the Conservatives is there's such an easy, if occasionally unfair and inaccurate, narrative in which it is the civilising, big-hearted, compassionate Lib Dems stopping the mad neoliberal axemen running amok. <laughs> Um, and what often happened is that the disagreements which might have been in the Cabinet Committee, which would anyway have happened between different groups of Conservatives, got spun afterwards as a Lib Dem triumph in stopping some nonsense happening. And so that, you could argue, has subtly sort of pushed the, made the Conservative brand, done exactly what David Cameron didn't want to do, and has kept the Conservative brand more tricky, more difficult than it should be because of this narrative. So that's the paradox. I think that's the problem for us. If I were now sitting in the Lib Dem shoes now, looking at the whole range of scenarios um, after May, it seems to me that if I were a Lib Dem, being the heart to the Tory head is a much clearer and more attractive narrative than being the head to Labour's heart. <laughs> and I think if I, when I, when I say that, oh, if we're in government with Labour, then what we would do, then suddenly they're going to be, we're going to be the custod we're going to be the chief secretary telling all these Labour big spenders how they can't really afford it. If I were in the Lib Dem shoes, my view is they have actually located themselves much more skillfully in the past five years because of the nature of this coalition than they would able, be able to do if they were in coalition with Labour, which is one of the many reasons why I hope that never happens. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>
um, if not majoritarian, at least single party. How, how true is that, David? Is, is there still a kind of majoritarian, at least a single party culture? Yes, I think there, there is still a belief, and I mean, I share it in a way, that the country uh, should be uh, governed, by, if I, because the, the natural aim of both the two main parties is to secure an overall majority. And the, the business of um, coalition building, and the whole fact that the government was essentially, its policies were determined in a document that people had not directly been able to vote on, um, is something that uh, makes one uncomfortable. Uh, I would agree the realities are that we appear to be into an increasing fractioning, but my view is that the, the, big, the t historic task of the, as you, in your words, majoritarian parties, was to construct our own coalitions. That was the business. Of par what parties did was they were to assemble a sufficiently wide range of views to be their, themselves capable of holding a majority. And in the, and the conservative tradition, what the British Conservative Party did was bring together two strands that were often fragmented on the continent, that's why they have a different model, which was, often on the continent you find a kind of rationalist, small L liberal, anti-clerical pro-business party, and a separate ruralist, church-linked um, <coughs> peasants party. Uh, and in British conservatism you see a combination of those two kinds of strands of political thought, and I personally think bringing them together into one political party and with something called British Conservatism is better than having all of them fragmented. Now, isn't there a different um, conflict within Lib Dems between being in government and since the purity you had before? And that's played out in a way in the coalition that some of the tensions between those of you who are ministers and those outside. Undoubtedly, we had all got used to the luxuries of being in opposition. I'd had 18 years on the opposition benches before um, the coalition was formed, so that did require quite a change of mindset. Uh, I think the Lib Dems have stepped up to the plate quite well in terms of coming to terms with the realities of being in government. To the extent that there are any tensions between those on the inside and those on the outside, these are largely a function of poor communications which we can only strive to improve. But I think that we have actually um, made that adjustment quite well. That said, I think it would be a mistake for the Liberal Democrats in the aftermath of this <coughs> election to think that just because we've done it once, we've got to do it twice. And I think we'll only drive a, a, a reasonable deal from our point of view if we are genuinely willing mm. to walk away um, and say no to an answer. It also depends how many MPs you get, too. It will, There's a credibility it, it, issue. It, it, it will, and um, picking up the point that you put to David, I mean, at the last election, the Conservative and Labour parties shared 65% of the vote. I didn't think they're going to share any more than that next time. Now, the other 35% may be gone in more directions mm. next time than it did last time at our expense. But either of them, I suspect, is still going to have to deal with uh, new diversity and pluralism in British politics, which every instinct tells me is here to stay. And the individual fortunes of individual parties may ebb and flow, but I don't think that process is going to go back into reverse. Yeah, now, on, on that point, how do I, I mean, it's clear from your, your Inside Out pamphlet for us you want a formalisation of agreements, you want a much more clearly, I mean, you say, nail everything down from the beginning. Um, not just on policy, but on departmentary and all that stuff. I mean, how, I mean, David, just starting with you, how reflecting would, should a multi-party government work differently? I mean, you know, essentially it was an experiment you were in, involved in, um, because first time in peacetime it would be done, wartime is very different. First time in peacetime it would be done for a long time. Yeah, I, I think where, where I disagree with what Nick was saying, I personally think the coalition agreement was quite a substantial document. And given events, dear boy, events, the idea you can write down in enormous detail everything you're going to do over the next five years, um, I, I don't quite think that's how government works. Um, maybe this should instead have been something more explicit about the systems for kind of conflict resolution in all the uncertainties 
and random events that happen whilst you are in government. As I said, the Monday meeting had became, in reality, that arrangement. But, but bizarrely, there was. Um, some of those involved in the negotiation, Andrew Stunnell, Lib Dem MP, who'd worked for years in the Association of Lib Dem Councillors, putting together local government coalitions, and Jim Wallace, who'd experience mm. of two coalitions in Scotland, put a lot of work into agreeing machinery that was supposed to troubleshoot things that uh, inevitably uh, arise, um, basically it's never met. Um, and th th this alternative of escalating everything, if you're a Liberal Democrat, to the Deputy Prime Minister's in-tray um, ha has been left to perform this role instead. I think that's bad. I mean, I don't, th I don't like the idea that you're choking up the Prime Minister's and the Deputy Prime Minister's in tray with what might be relatively trivial mm. departmental business. And I think that the, the combination of actually having a coalition mm. sort of a, a committee of whips and party managers yeah. and um, Willy Whitelaw types to uh, iron out the relatively more uh, trivial stuff and only escalating really yeah. serious political disagreements to PM and DPM would yeah. be a better way but, of But, but that's where, I mean, of course, it's just different experiences. Different, but that's basically what Vince and I would sort out. We would, we would try to agree amongst ourselves. How to do it. And in general, we were aware it was one of the departments where the coalition would be tested and had to be made to work. And, and we would, the two of us would have a, our own version of a Monday morning discussion and just kind of sort things out. And it, get, here's a serious guy and you could normally work something out. I didn't, we didn't need, but we, we regarded having to externalise it beyond biz as itself kind of a poor reflection on our ability to sort out a way to run the department. I, I agree, and, and I did the same at Defence, and w when I ceased to hold office, one of the pieces of feedback the Chief Whip gave to me was, oh, you were too good at sorting out your own trouble. If you'd escalated uh, it all to the DPM, uh, he'd, uh, he'd have known more what you were up to. Right, let, let, let's open up out at this stage, um, and we'll take some questions. Right. Um, Starting Mark there and the gentleman behind. We'll take a couple at a time then. Thanks. Mark Darcy, BBC. Um, I was very interested in David's comment about the natural ambition of Labour and the Conservatives to be to build up a broad enough sort of range of opinion within themselves that they could govern in their own right. And I was wondering, the nasty suspicion forms in my mind that at least some people in the Conservative Party saw the coalition as an exercise in kind of destructive engagement. You could chip off enough Liberal Democrats, <laughs> in, in the, in naming no particular members for Taunton, you could chip off enough Liberal Democrats to uh, attract them into, uh, into your uh, big tent of their own right, and, and off you'd go. And the history backs that up. I mean, historically, the Conservatives had... Um, David uh, Lloyd George's yeah. son, uh, yeah. David Lloyd George's son, as a Home That's Secretary. Cool. Ramsay Macdonald's son was a Conservative minister. Over the years, you've always tended to do that. Yeah. And, 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 and the second one behind, then we'll, we'll, we'll take the two together. Uh, ben Alexander, I'm a commercial advisor to the Cabinet Office. Um, I'd actually like to ask Nick um, two questions about his points about representation in a future negotiation. I think, in a nutshell you are arguing that you underestimated your negotiation position. Um, and as an aside, after negotiation, that's quite a routine feeling, actually, whether or not you did. Um, and I think David Willits has hinted that maybe the Conservatives felt the same thing too. So, um, But I've got one sort of political and, um, and one mechanistic question. The political one is, in your pamphlet, you, took, you suggest that you didn't rely enough on your share of the vote as opposed to your share of the seats. And in the next election, we have the possibility that actually the Lib Dems get a disproportionate number of MPs to their vote yep. for the first time, so you wouldn't be able to rely on that. And in that case, would it be tenable, as you are, are suggesting, that you should have representation in each department? Uh, which then leads on to the mechanistic question. Uh, and I noted that David Willits has made far more um, uh, uh, reference to cabinet committees than you have and actually would cabinet committees be a way for you to achieve that kind of representation that you need if you can't get the representation in terms of seats? Got two interesting points there. Uh, Nick, do you want to start then? Well, I'm with David, yeah. I mean, the point I was making in my pamphlet about the percentage share of the vote was that that is how I had expected the negotiation would have gone, that the Tories would have said to us, you've got a sixth of the seat, you get a sixth of the government, and we'd have said, yes, but we've got a third of the vote will get a third of the government, and we'd have settled somewhere halfway between the two. Um, if we end up in the next parliament with a situation where we've got um, 
a smaller vote and a smaller number of seats. The critical thing is, are we the difference between them making a government and not making a government, or are they going to have to bolt on you know, support from a miscellany of others? I mean, the, the more different elements they're reliant on, the weaker our negotiating position, I entirely get that. But actually, if, if the participation of a, a well-disciplined, uh, according to David, um, troop of Lib Dems is the difference between forming government and not forming a government, then I, I would restate my assertion that that's what we should be looking for. David. Yeah, I, I think on Mark's question, the, uh, you're absolutely right about the history, and there was a process in which the Conservative Party grew by uh, taking on at several stages, the Liberal Democrat, Liberals as they fragmented. In fact, this is a kind of Peter Riddle type mm. fact. But my, my <laughs> Thanks, David. Thanks. <laughs> <my, laughs> so don't don't words, out nerd me. Yeah. In other words, extraordinary insightful. <laughs> they, but they took the historical part. Uh, my recollection is in 50 or 51, when mm. Churchill was doing his letters of endorsement to Conservative mm. parliamentary candidates, they had, I think, something like. 13 different official titles okay. as he went around the country and they all had their labels and yeah. some were conservative and national liberals and some were conservative and liberal and some were unionist. He had to, they had, there was some memoir they were called, they had to get it right because they were fighting under so many subtly different uh, official titles across the country. And that, and there were indeed people within my party <coughs> who thought that we could find, we might make the coalition work so well that this kind of process carried on. Uh, it doesn't look as if it's quite played out that way, has it? Right. Okay. Uh, hold on. You wait for the mic. Yeah. Thanks. And then, then I'll, I'll move back. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Akash Pound from the Institute for Government. Um, well, the first part of my question has sort of been touched upon, but um, to address it in a slightly different way, I mean, uh, Nick, in terms of the, your recommendations, um, I think the Institute for Government would would agree with quite a few of, of those in terms, in particularly around um, some of the um, institutions and protocols for making coalition government work, yeah. um, sharing of information, no surprises principle, proper process, and we've, we've said that kind of thing before. So, I mean, I, I do think that kind of just makes for better government. Some of the other ones are obviously more political, more political. Yeah. <laughs> um, and particularly around the distribution of, of ministerial portfolios. I mean, that what you've um, suggested your party should demand in, in the future, <laughs> to me, reads like quite good advice for 2010 in terms of the share of votes and, and seats you won then. I mean, on the assumption, you know, you're going to win less of both in 2015, and this is slightly been touched upon. I mean, what's your kind of fallback strategy, assuming a quarter of the ministerial seats is, is, is probably not likely um, to be on the table? Um, do you then choose a few departments to, to prioritize and, 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 and go for ones where there's some key policies you want to, to win and just try and take the, a few key jobs? Or are you actually thinking as the fallback option you don't do a coalition deal and you negotiate something looser like a confidence and supply agreement. And is that something you've thought about how you'd make it work? Yeah, we'll do this as a, 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 a one-off and then I'll, I'll, I'll group some together. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I would take the view that if the Conservatives were to get a similar number of seats to what they got last time, 307, which I think it would be an incredibly tall order, but let's follow your logic. Perhaps they were to do that. And we got, I don't know, 33, say, uh, participation is the difference between them trying to form a minority government of 307 or having a thumpingly good working majority um, of sort of 25 or 30. And if, if that's what's on offer um, from the Liberal Democrats to them, I, I would not be trimming back my demands in there one inch. If they're going to have to talk to Scottish nationalists or UKIP or um, Welsh nationalists or DUP or all manner of people as well, and we are only going to be one component part, then I accept the fact that obviously we're in a less strong negotiating position. I think we would still be looking for something that was, con was big enough to be viable for a party of national ambition and reach, but it, it might not be possible 
to get everything there that I'm demanding, and possibly that's where the, the idea of cabinet committees would, would, would come back into it more. But uh, that, I think we were, you know, in that multi-party situation, uh, you know, I'm not sure how keen I would be to take part if the Conservatives could get some Faustian pact going with the SNP and the DUP. God help a lot of them, would be my view, but I'd rather, <laughs> I'd rather not be anything to do with it. <laughs> this issue of kind of uh, cabinet committee, just to sort of how it works, and I'm just from my experience, um, because I think we're making slightly heavy weather of it. The, uh, first of all, obviously, the cabinet gets to see... Um, there's an enormous range of circulation via cabinet ministers, which ensures that in the main and which ensures that in the main coalition departments, Vince and me or Danny and George or whatever, you'd start from that shared position. Though it would regard as quite bad form to have an explicit kind of Lib Dem conservative row in the same department in cabinet. It looked peculiar if George had turned up yeah. and said Danny had said the opposite, or Vince and I had explicitly disagreed. Um, you've then got this kind of three-part, three-cornered stool, and it's fascinating how they work differently. The NSC, which I'm least familiar with, and neither Vince nor I sat on the NSC, but chaired by the PM, and clearly with an uh, important role for the DPM. By all accounts, people think that has functioned very well. Um, Home Affairs was, uh, which I sat on, and which the DPM chaired, handled a very large amount of domestic business, and because the Deputy Prime Minister was chairing it, ensured that he and his office had an overview of the main flow of departmental business. And my approach on that would have been, if there was anything really contentious, to discuss it with Vince and try to have a kind of know where we were. Wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought it would be fair for me to turn up and just say what I thought without knowing what he thought on a contentious item. Um, then the third leg, the economic one, was in some ways the most complex because the Economic Affairs Committee rarely met. It was much more a circulation list than a set of meetings and ended up being fragmented into an incredible number of different economic committees doing various specific things. Um, and uh, that... And I think, so there was, so in some ways there was a lot of cabinet committee discussion, but with an ever-changing cast. Um, and I think, again, now you, you had, obviously, a lot of the time, um, you had Conservative and Lib Dem representation. I have to say, it was at the end, towards the end of my time, as, the, as I one sensed that the pressures on the coalition building was the first time I, and I had the experience of turning up at a cabinet committee with the understanding and knowing that Vince was also going to turn up so that we could argue different positions. Mm -hmm. And that did feel peculiar. That felt, I thought this is not how we would have functioned uh, three years ago. And then the de de delicate issue of the Cabinet Committee is whether the Lib Dems have a kind of automatic right of veto. And the reality was that you couldn't bring government completely to a halt. But if the Lib Dems, even though they were in a minority in the Cabinet Committee, really felt strongly about it, you knew that they had the kind of right to bring it up at the Monday meeting of the DPM or the PM, that you didn't want the whole business of government to clog up with every time there was a bit of disagreement, that happened. Thanks. So that's just to kind of set the record of how I saw the system function. Very, very interesting. Now, um, Matthew, then I can... Uh, Matthew Trimming, we focused a lot on process. Can I just ask a question about personality? Because one of the things that underpins the success of the coalition, and I think it has been a success, is that you seem to have got personalities right, where perhaps previous governments, maybe the immediate one preceding you, rather struggled with personalities. Looking forward to three months hence, how much should personality alongside process play on the minds of the leaders who are ultimately going to be uh, conducting these negotiations? Uh, and oh, behind you. Um. Thanks. Duncan Brack. Um, I was Special Advisor to Chris Hewn at the Department of Energy and Climate Change until that job came to a slightly sudden end, uh, exactly three years ago, actually, I think, today. Um, I agree so I saw some of what tie, yeah. some <laughs> saw, uh, I saw quite a lot of what Nick's been talking about from the inside for a bit, and I agree with everything he says. Um, just a couple of observations, and then I've got a question. Um, we generally didn't have any problems within DEC on uh, agreements, uh, disagreements between a Lib Dem Secretary of State and three Tory junior ministers. Our problems came with other departments, particularly the Treasury, sometimes CLG, sometimes Transport, and those are the questions that had to be bounced up to 
uh, Clegg and Cameron, or sometimes the Quad with Osborne and Alexander as well. And then on cabinet committees, I mean, the membership of the cabinet committees was skewed to make sure the Lib Dems were, in a sense, overrepresented on all of them to try and deal with the questions that people have been talking about. Um, and part of my job was to respond to the right rounds that we got on the uh, European Affairs and the Economic Affairs Committee. And certainly we had a regular stream of responses to insane proposals from generally from the Home Office to opt out of very sensible negotiations on various EU directives. And generally our experience was those weren't resolvable in the committee. Again, they had to be bounced up to uh, the Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister or the Quad. So um, the system in sense didn't, it may have resolved some of the issues, but it wasn't uh, by any means a fail safe. But the question I had, um, was uh, looking at the position of the Lib Dems now in the opinion polls, it's difficult to argue that the coalition has been particularly good for us. So the question then arises, are the things we should have done differently over the last five years? And one thing that people often point to is the lengths to which we went, and particularly Nick Clegg went, in the first year or so to bend over backwards to make it clear that coalition government was working. Uh, and you can look at some of the speeches Nick made in that period, including the Autumn 2010 conference, where he talked about the coalition being more than the sum of its parts, uh, and even saying, I think, that he preferred the coalition, or implying that he preferred the coalition programme to his own party's election manifesto, which, in retrospect, is a bit crazy. Um, and uh, as a result, the argument is that we simply submerged our identity within the coalition, and we have never right recovered from that. Right, so response to that would be good. One other question in this round, and I'll move on to round uh, up here. Uh, Kerry, just, yeah, thanks. Thanks, um, Alex Allen. Um, uh, Nick's played quite a bit about the position where the um, Liberal Democrats plus either the Conservatives or Labour didn't have an overall majority and there were other parties involved. Can you envisage a position where the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats or the Labour and Liberal Democrats actually formed a minority coalition? So they formed a coalition without having an overall majority? But for, yeah, which, which is not unknown, in fact, in Sweden, had a very similar to that. Three diverse questions there. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Alex is, that's one of the many possible permutations that people are speculating about. And uh, uh, there's a whole host of possibilities, but that, is, that is, must be on the long list of possibilities, yes. Uh, I think on the Lib Dem identity, I think you're slightly beating up on yourself. I think that the Lib Dems have c uh, kept a distinctive identity. Um, on person, uh, and my, actually, sorry, my, the, my final point on both identity, it relates to personalities, and I think personalities do matter, and it was lucky that, I mean, I had enormous respect for Vince and enjoyed working with him. Um, but the, the, you think you mustn't exaggerate the importance of personality in all this, and in fact, I think what's something missing from our discussion so far is just the usual clash of Whitehall departmental interests, yes. and the fact that good government depends to some extent on role playing. Good government depends on a set of legitimate arguments that are often illuminated and brought up within a departmental structure being laid before the government as a whole, which is one of the legitimate jobs of departmental minister. And hence, your list of the sort of tensions between DEC, as you listed the other ministers, let's face it, there were tensions between DEC and BIS. Uh, so, for example, energy intensive industries, energy intensive industries where BIS had long standing concerns about whether we would, how we would maintain our competitiveness with Germany, which looked after its energy intensive industries as we went through some of the understandable aims to properly pricing carbon. Those led to arguments between Vince and Chris Hoon. And it doesn't matter if they'd been the same party, the different party, they were just two different views, understandable views on a real world issue. And similarly, a lot of the time, Danny, as the chief secretary, was the person saying, I'm sorry, we can't afford this, we can't go ahead with it. He was doing the inevitable and necessary job of chief secretary. Mm. So we shouldn't just forget that part of it, and that is a crucial part, and that is not a bad thing, that is one of the ways in which government properly functions. I think personalities do matter, and it's clearly one of the reasons why the quad works, is that the four of them self-evidently get on okay and make that work. Um, in defense, Jeff Hoon, had come within weeks of being the longest serving ever uh, defence secretary when he left. And they then had one a year for about the next six years. And the tales that the civil servants and the military told about the different approaches uh, to collegial working and running a department of the quick succession of defence secretaries they had seen left me in no doubt whatever that, that, that however robust your system, personality plays an awful lot in 
in the process of government. Should it cloud the negotiation next time? Uh, no, I, I doubt it. But um, personal chemistry has carried this coalition quite a long way. If the personal chemistry hadn't been there, I think things would have broken down in, in, a, in a major way. Um, Duncan's given us some insight to energy. David's talked about business. Of course, both of those were departments headed by a Liberal Democrat um, Secretary of State, but with a largely Conservative team underneath them. And I think the dynamic there is slightly different to, for example, in the Home Office, where Lynn Featherstone, the first time around, had a very junior post in an otherwise quite right-wing Tory lineup, and I think that was hard going. I don't think we've lost our identity as much in a coalition with the Tories where, other than sort of um, Labour leaflet writers, nobody really thinks that we are proxy Tories. But I think if we'd been in with Labour, it would have been quite a lot more difficult mm. to have sustained our mm. identity. Mm. And as David was saying about the, the, the heart and head point, um, you know, it, we, we might have been on the wrong end of the... The, the, the deal on that, I don't know. I think you're right, but I think the point about coalition working is now made. Coalition has worked. It's endured for five years. Given the immensity of the struggles, it's really not been a bad government. So um, I think that point is made, and we shouldn't feel an absolute need to trade too much political capital into making it again. A coalition, Alex, that fails to deliver a majority, God... It's an ugly prospect. Um, looking at the polls, it's by no means an impossible one. Uh, I'd be quite reluctant to get involved in that. It sounds to me an inherently weak government, and unless you, unless the DUP or the SNP or somebody has sold their granny on some understanding that gives you to believe you can make it work, I have to say I'd be more inclined to let the larger party have a go on their own. Right on there. Now, I've got, um, I think we can just about take most of those. Um, I'll start uh, over there with Robert Hazel, then move to the back and then come up. Yeah. We'll take four this time. Thank you. Robert Hazel, fellow at the Institute. Quick one about media management. In the pamphlet, Nick, you recommend uh, much more unrestricted access by Lib Dem ministers to the media uh, without, with a lessening of control by the centre, and in particular from number 10. One of the impressive things about this coalition has been the very tight collective discipline by Lib Dem ministers. Mm. And if they had a right, in effect, as I read your pamphlet, to go and blab to the media whenever they think they've lost or they're concerned they're going to lose, couldn't that quickly degenerate into mutual sniping and undermine the, the collective discipline that holds the coalition together? OK, fine. And right at the back... Um Paul Tyler, then we'll, we'll come up to the very patient gentleman there. Paul Tyler, um, only a small bit player in 2010. Can I ask uh, David and Nick to just look at the likely different scenario, assuming for a moment no majority, overall majority, um, and put our minds back to May 2010, when I think there were two very special features of the scenario. One was everybody assumed it was a temporary aberration. The experience of the 60s and 70s was you went with it for a bit and then you had a second election. But of course, this time, very craftily, we produced the Fixed Term Parliament Act. So the novelty is gone. But it was also, of course, the circumstances when we were being told by the Daily Mail that a hung parliament meant people being hung from the lampposts and uh, riots in the streets and the pound would collapse, etc., etc. Simply having been through that and emerged the other end reasonably intact. How do you think the mechanics, assuming, in May 2010 and 2015 will vary? Very interesting one. Yeah, and moving, moving forward, Kerry, just in front of you. Yeah. My name's John Cartledge. My question is about assent and accountability. Who owns this decision to enter into a coalition in the first place? Nick referred to a conclave of um, Lib Dem hierarchs and Transport House, but ultimately it went to ratification by a party conference. David just referred to the reluctant cooperation or endorsement of the Tory backbenches, but I believe there's been some indication another time around the um, responsibility for taking that decision would be cast more widely. As a 
grassroots party hack, but a strong believer in internal party, de intra-party democracy, and that ultimately it is we who own the decisions that are taken in our name by the party leadership. I would expect any decision of that kind part of my party to enter into any agreement with the enemy we've just been fighting for tooth and nail for weeks and months to be the subject of a plebiscite of the members. And I wouldn't expect their consent to be lightly given. Right, and one carry here by Helen Bailey. Thank you, uh, Helen Bailey. Just a sort of um, question that relates to where you landed, really. Um, I just wondered if you had any top-of-the-head thoughts about how the civil service ought to be changed if coalition was to become a more normal feature of the way we did business. You started off by talking about the parties as wanting to be monoliths. I, ca I was a civil servant at the time, having recently been a local government chief exec in a world in which part of your job as an official is to broker deals between politicians and to ensure that business happens and, in fact, to carry the can if business is not properly done. And observed to my amusement and sometimes horror that in Whitehall... Um, there was a different approach to managing politics and civ civil servants were on the whole more protected from it, however fascinated by it, and might sometimes fall into the temptation of simply observing who seemed to be the stronger character and working to their agenda. Now that may be a bit of kind of caricature analysis, uh, but it prompts me to ask what else needs to change as well as the politics. That's a very, very interesting point there. Uh, David, as a former civil servant yourself, <laughs> Yes, I think the, I think, uh, as I say, after Gus gave the marching orders, and I think the only way possible, I think in general the um, machine worked pretty well. Um, I think they probably, the machine could have been more sensitive to the views of the other party. Um, and so I suspect part of Nick's frustration is that the, MOD machine, especially that in a military, uh, you know, command type model, has a boss, the Secretary of State. The idea that this is a com government comprising two parties and each party has, right, has a separate view. And Nick was not simply a, a kind of usual Minister of State in a single party government, but represented a second party in the coalition and had a distinctive role in all that. I could well imagine that there were parts of Whitehall for whom that kind of recognition of the two party nation, nature of the functioning of their department, was sometimes hard for them to get, and I think that's, in, that's important. Um, I think the trouble with the sort of plebiscitary model where the plebiscite only goes to the party members is that the party members are often not themselves representative of the wider party supporters or people who voted for it. And what do we, the business of Her Majesty's government has to carry on. What if all these plebiscitary party members all turn down the deal? I mean, there comes a point when someone has to do the deal breaking um, the main comment, I, but I wanted to go back to what Paul was saying, which, which prompts sort of how, how would it be different this time? And also, and maybe I should give a fuller answer to sort of kind of Alex's questions about scenarios. Um, there is sometimes you hear that there's either confidence and supply or there's a coalition. But remember, even our coalition agreement in 2010 had a small number of clauses which were identified as areas where each party would go their own way. And the truth is there is a spectrum here. And that you could, I think my forecast would be if there's a coalition agreement, there would be more of those sorts of clauses. So you have a common agenda that you could imagine could be more limited and more areas where you agree that you would be explicit about your disagreements. And I think one of the pressure points during the campaign, which the party leaders are all aware of, is the great red lines question, which barely came up in the campaign of 2010. Would you negotiate this away in a coalition agreement? And certainly one of the nightmare scenarios is everybody turning up in, in after the next election without an overall majority, but in the pressure of the debate, all the different leaders have committed themselves to a whole host of red lines, which should have the same kind of practical effect as your plebiscitary proposal of making the deal more difficult. So I could imagine something that was less than the full-blown coalition we've had this time, but perhaps a bit more than simply confidence and supply. Nick. And also taking Robert's point on, on the... Um... Uh, R R Robert's point, I mean, I'm not suggesting that Tory ministers should all be enslaved to the number 10 press machine and Lib Dem ministers should all be free agents. That would be absurd. 
I'm saying that the Lib Dem ministers should answer to the DPM's press machine in the same way that the Tory ministers answer to the PM's press machine. And if there are then clashes, they sort them out at that level. But I found having a, a blue a blue pencil being put on articles I was writing or speeches that I was giving completely unacceptable. And uh, I think the idea that you put together a partnership of two political parties and then allow one's spads to blue pencil the other one's minister's utterances is, is just unsustainable nonsense. So I, I think there has to be discipline, but it, 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 it probably needs to be brokered at a higher level. Ownership of the decisions, David was right earlier on, it served us very well that the entire party had bought into the decision to go into the coalition. When the going got tough, and by God it did, the fact that people had taken collective ownership of that massive strategic gamble served the leadership very well. If it, if it were to come about again, and there were another special conference of the sort we had last time, I've no idea what the outcome would be, but I'll tell you this, you won't get 1,500 people gathered and only 10 against, which is what you had last time. There'll be a much more meaningful debate about anything, whether it's a fully blown coalition or um, something short of that, of the sort that David is talking about. And there are plenty of permutations short of that. I'd be quite inclined to offer a, a reasonable government supply, but might be much more hesitant about offering them uh, confidence. Uh, I think in terms of the um, uh, agreement to disagree, I think we were mad to accept abstention. It was a completely ridiculous thing to have agreed. It hands to the Conservatives a majority they haven't won. If we absolutely cannot agree and the agreement is to disagree, the answer is to put it on the floor of the House of Commons and see what support can be gained from anywhere else. Uh, you're not going to have coherent government if you do that once a week, but if, if you allow that in a limited number of situations, I think that is the only feasible way um, to uh, unblock it. And Paul Tyler is right. I think that circumstances will be a bit different next time. Prove the world doesn't end and coalition cannot work. Uh, and H Helen Bailey's point that the civil service need to sort of wise up a bit and stop being quite so virginal about it. I mean, they're very clever people. They could learn an awful lot from local government officers who have had to get their hands a bit dirtier with these things over a period of time. And they should, as David said, recognise the coalition dynamic in every department. And the legitimate business of the minister in that department from the smaller party to involve him or herself in everything that's, that's going on. Yeah, I, mean, that, I think that last point ties in with a sense of adaptation but not really changing that the system is adapted yes. because something happened in 2010, we had to adapt, but not fundamentally rethinking the method of operation. I mean, and I think one of the interesting questions post well, three months' time is if you've got another hung parliament, would it force deeper changes in the behaviour in Whitehall, etc.? Because certainly the impression is you've adapted a bit and some Lib Dems got an extra private secretary or what happened with the extra support. But the, the machine was aimed at secretaries of state because that's how, yeah. how, how people operate. Except when you know, had, had a much more complicated setup like your one, where there was a, in, in biz, where there was a clearly defined area which you were responsible for, David. Yes, and I would say also, and Vince and I did discuss this because at various times there was sort of a range, as part of the, I think, understandable strengthening of the DPM's office, there were then various ideas for more. Uh, special, well, but either more special advisors, overtly political, or more kind of specialist experts being brought in. And Vince, uh, Vince and, and again, different people departed. Vince and I concluded that we would be in danger of having an arms race. And I would say, I want two more people in, to which he would say, I would, in which case, I must have two more people in, and we'd end up growing staff, and their main job would be to dispute with each other before Vince and I got to have an exchange about it. So we took a deliberate self denying ordinance that we did not wish to escalate and we didn't want to start placing our people through the machine um, and we would rely on the biz machine as a whole to brief both of us properly. Now again I think by the end I think Vince, I think Vince now does have, he may need now have three advisors but we had, we had, we made that work in the uh, and it's not necessarily how every department should function but that was us absolutely settling for a, a modest change in the mm. model of the civil service. And I think there is a danger that you just 
embody. You just, if you start having, I'm the Lib Dem expert in this field, I'm the Conservative expert in this field, you just spend too much time in the department with those dis debates to all levels. Right. Um, can I just ask you one final thing, and you touched on it, Nick. It's clear from the discussion that the pressures from internal party, the pressures for defining more clearly um, what the understandings are, and I use the word understanding rather than the agreement because who knows what the, you know, the spectrum, um, as David defined it, may be. Um, is there a willingness to, the five days, actually you could argue was 13 days, because the until the programme for government was defined, but there was a government functioning yes. um, after, the, after about six, seven days. Um, how long do you think the system <laughs> would tolerate it? David. Germany functioned for five weeks before the Grand Coalition was formed um, uh, 15 months ago, and it seems to be a reasonably well-governed country. Yeah. I think if it... Obviously, I hope this won't be necessary, but I can imagine it could be... I could imagine three or four weeks this time if we're in the scenario where there's no overall majority. I think if the incumbent Prime Minister, and for that matter, Deputy Prime Minister, because we'll still have an incumbent Deputy Prime Minister, are involved in the talks, that's a completely different situation from the last time when it became clear Gordon Brown wasn't going to be able to form a second government. And he was basically itching to go and thought that the nation wouldn't tolerate him staying put much longer as a caretaker. But if it were Cameron and Clegg who were hammering it out, I think, as David says, it, it could definitely go a small number of weeks, and it would be better if it did. I mean, you can't hammer out exactly what's going to happen for five years, obviously, because events happen. But you could hammer out a route map for five years, which would have a lot more detail on what you were going to do in years one and two and a lot more sort of just basic structure for years three, four and five and it really would be worth taking the time to do that in, in my view. Um, all I can say is watch this space at the IFG. Um, we, we've got two events coming up um, in um, February and March looking at... Hmm? March, I, I, I'm corrected by Akash over there, um, on which we'll be looking at coalition and minority government. We'll be producing a publication on, on that. Equally, um, if David's uh, warning is right, and watch this space in May, we're deliberately keeping our events programme flexible. <laughs> um, um, uh, I look at um, um, our, our, our head of that. Um, um, we're keeping that flexible. We'll certainly, but the IFG, be actively commenting and looking at what's happening. But to... Um, I wouldn't say start off, but to uh, stimulate um, the debate. Could I thank, um, on your behalf, Nick Harvey very much for his very mm. uh, fascinating mm. Inside Out, and particularly uh, to David Willits yeah. coming here today um, from, your, from, from your experience operating the coalition. Also, w welcome back to the IFG after your period in, in government. Good to see you here again. Thank you, and could you all, all, all thank you very much. Thank you.